I guess you're all wondering uh, what's going to happen in this talk because everyone's been talking about IoT, IoT, IoT. Uh, I'm going to take a step back and go to what brought me to IoT, something that's 11 years back. Uh, I did research in a certain area which I think is very strongly related to the so-called IoT we want to see in the future, like the ones we see in sci-fi movies. Uh, but I think it's not being talked about. Most of the talks I've seen revolve around some things which are pre pretty common across the landscape. Uh, this is something I bring back from 11 years ago and how it relates to what needs to be the future. Uh, I may not be completely correct, but that's my view at this point. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, I head product management for a financial tech company, but uh, I also, we run a small think tank, uh, I had innovation for that, uh, and uh, the reason why I'm back here at the IoT stage is 2000, 2001, when I was uh, involved in extensive research around mobile ad hoc networks, and a lot of this stuff revolved around survivable networks that the DOD wanted back in the 80s. Uh, what kind of uh, war zone scenarios can where you don't have fixed network, you don't have base stations, how could you have an entire battalion, cavalry, infantry coordinate across uh, a difficult topology, difficult landscape, and still be connected? So that's kind of where I bring uh, my IoT flavor from. Uh, I can yeah, go in further. So, you know, good old internet, 20, 30 years, it's been working fine, seven layers. Uh, IPTCP kind of took over the whole OSI space. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the history of the internet, ARPA, DARPA, all that fun stuff? Okay. Uh, how many people are familiar how IPTCP became the winner against all the other form former uh, competitors? Finally, we have one person. So there's a history to uh, how these protocols evolved. Everyone today, uh, including you know, us, we assume that it was all designed by one person or designed by a standard body and life is good. But there was an evolution to all of this. And it's, it was perfect for the fixed base internet, right? If you look at the old internet, or I would say the current internet, let's say mobile is out. Uh, most of it is lots and lots of nodes connected all over the globe. The wires are fixed, optic fiber, all kinds of links, right? What's happened with the mobile uh, internet, right? We have all these standards that allow us to communicate with the internet uh, at the different levels, at the network level or at the transport level. Um, there are a lot of protocols at the physical level in terms, for example, the most common Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all, all these kinds of things allow us to connect at a physical level. What happens is right now, even we, when we think about mobile internet, what we are actually is, our mobile phone is pretty much always connected to a base station. And it hands off from base station to base station. Now, how many people have been to conferences besides this one before? Uh, ever try to use Wi-Fi during a conference? Try using it in a conference where there's 5,000 people. Not going to happen. What happens? What's, ha what's going on? We are trying to connect to limited amount of base stations. There will always be limited amount of base stations. And we congest the air. It's not the lack of uh, intelligence on the part of you know, Wi-Fi based on a good old uh, CSMA, CA. Uh, if anyone's technical enough to remember that. But there's a mechanism by which all the Wi-Fi devices kind of sh use this shared airspace to talk, which is why you will never have reception interference on your hard line, but you may have interference in a wireless connection. So part of the biggest problem is we've been focusing all on protocols around you know MQTT and uh, a AMQP, all those things, right? They're all above the transport level. The biggest problem is, you know, most of this stuff was designed to connect on a fixed base internet. We've added mobile on top. We've added mobile layers on top, mobile hosts, all those kinds of things on top. 
in an ad hoc network, and the reason why I bring ad hoc network, um, let me think of a scenario, war zone, uh, disaster zone, you're in an emergency response area, fixed networks are down, you need teams to coordinate across uh, five different zones on an island, how do you connect, how do you communicate? Uh, in a war zone scenario, what if uh, there are five different battalions they're trying to connect and uh, one of them gets captured by enemy lines, what are you gonna do? So all these kind of scenarios are what ad hoc networks were devised for, uh, researched by DOD in the 80s, and it still goes on. The reason why I bring it to IoT stage is um, I carry maybe three, four devices on an average, uh, iPad, laptop, an iPhone, and maybe a Bluetooth headset. Uh, anyone more, more than that? Maybe five, six devices on an average? Four, most people? Who's, who's got four? Three? Okay. So imagine managing this phone, this iPad, and this laptop is pain enough for me to synchronize data between them. And with just enough number of laptops in this conference, we are saturating the Wi-Fi connections. Imagine IoT space, as my dear friend out here standing there, he said, fast forward a few years down the line. Uh, I think Julian, right? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Uh, so fast forward a few years down the line, everyone having 20, 30 devices on them. Forget 10, let's say 10. Imagine the congestion in the airspace, the amount of crosstalk that's gonna be happening. Do you think all the devices are gonna work well? I don't think so. The other thing that I'm thinking is, what's the point of me carrying 10 devices? It's gonna make my life more complex. I have trouble managing four devices. So the goal of all the IoT and these devices, what is the goal? Uh, for GE uh, or a factory environment, you want seamlessness if, on whatever activities you're doing. In the home environment, uh, if, if your partner, your wife, your, someone tells you, hey, uh, you gotta, you gotta pick up. Uh, you gotta take take the kids to school. Uh, you gotta pick up something from Costco, and you gotta pick up uh, this guy's friend uh, Tommy from their, his parents' place, and then drop them off to karate class. Now, assuming that we had the intelligence to decipher all that information uh, over voice, that are those are still five six points of information. When I get into the car. I'm typing in each information. I'm looking for, okay, where does this guy stay? Where do I pick him up from? Um, first I put this into the GPS, then I put another GPS. There's too many things that I have to do, even though the information is there. The goal is for, if, if I'm, I'm told by uh, someone that, hey, uh, do these five things on the way to the office. As soon as I enter the car, the GPS of the car should pick up the information from my phone or from my Bluetooth or somewhere. The connectivity between different devices in my personal environment, from home to car to the office, needs to be seamless. I shouldn't want to have to uh, always try to connect, unconnect, disconnect, pass things back and forth. And this is why I'm saying most of IoT will actually be an extended ad hoc network. Whether or not you're connected to the internet uh, at, a, at a base level, whether or not uh, you have uh, uh, a war scenario, doesn't matter. The number of devices that you need to seamlessly be able to dance between, or should I say the devices need to dance with each other so that they can do your job easier for you. I don't want a device to be pain for me. I want the device such that I can forget about it, right? What's the goal of my iPhone? So that I use it, I forget about it. It's, it's not my job to play with it all day. That seamlessness will cause every IoT scenario to become a mobile ad hoc network, at least most of them. There may be some scenarios where you may have certain things which will not move. A washing machine probably won't move a lot. But a lot of this game, uh, when you, the, the, the stuff you see in sci-fi movies, will be around ad hoc networks, mobile ad hoc networks, and so far, and I may be wrong, I've not seen many people in the IoT space talk about it. I've Googled around for IoT and mobile ad hoc networks. I didn't find too many correlated links, and I think that's gonna be a big missing piece uh, which no one's talking about. So 
just just go into mobile ad hoc networks, right? IP, TCP, life is good in the internet. When you get into mobile ad hoc networks, when I have five devices on me, when you have five devices on you, 10 devices, and n number of people walking in a crowded city like Manhattan, going back and forth, those are huge, complex mobile ad hoc networks. How do you, how do you account for that? Now, these are the questions that no one's been asking. And for the, to, to, to give you a little bit of insight, right? Over the last 10, 15 years, uh, so I, I already jumped through this, talked to this, right? But you know, the internet was based. Then you had the last mile, which is the cell phone, which is you know, your mobile last mile. When you get into ad hoc networks at a personal level, you're not talking last mile. You're talking uh, last inch, last feet. So I should be able to give some device I have to a friend of mine and say, hey, go, go drive my car. Right? A lot of this handoff is still complex. If I want to pair my Bluetooth headset or I want to pair my cell phone to a rental car, it's pain every time I have to do this. Imagine doing this for 20 devices. We need better, faster, cleaner mechanisms to connect mobile ad hoc networks. Otherwise, the IoT dream will be pretty much remote monitoring. And to give you an example, a friend of mine did remote monitoring for uh, oil drilling stations 10 years back. It's just remote device monitoring. That is not what I see as IoT. When I see IoT, I'm thinking I'm walking, you know, if someone's walking through a factory, they don't need to think or look for 10 things. As they walk from location to location, they have something coming up. If I'm going from the car to my tennis club, a lot of things are done for me as I proceed through my tasks. I shouldn't have to play with it all the time. So what are mobile ad hoc networks? I've talked about it. Basically, what we're, do we're talking about is a self-organizing network where devices are smart enough to manage between each other. Uh, they're free to move about. The nodes can move away from each other. Uh, I may, I may be, you know, handing a device between uh, from myself to a friend, and I hand it off to him. Now, as I leave, it leaves my vicinity; it's gone. So, what's happening in a mobile ad hoc network is the performance degrades for all existing protocols like TCP and IP. Uh, well, IP is IP is just best best effort, right? But TCP and I, IP are what we all rely on it fails miserably in a mobile ad hoc network scenario. And that is what the IoT will bring to us at a big, big scale. And you know, I can, people sometimes mix uh, mesh networks with mobile ad hoc networks. Um, so um, an example of a mesh network that's not a mobile ad hoc network is lamp posts on a street. You may want to monitor uh, your repair guy who's uh, fixing all the lamp posts uh, on a street, and you're checking if all those are working or not. But they're not moving among each other to cause issues for you. And what's going to happen with IoT uh, is things will be moving a lot. Not the big machines, but human, human nature, right? We are ad hoc people. When you walk through a crowd out here at the conference, did you plan the route you were taking, how you were moving around? You're zigzag all over the place. And when we're talking IoT, we're talking around us. It's not about just fixing machines, machine to machine exchange. The machine to machine stuff is there to serve us eventually. Whether I'm at, at, uh, at home or whether I'm at the factory, it's around making my life easier. It's around making things seamless. And we are ad hoc creatures. We go all over the place, random nature, which is why Mobile ad hoc networks is what we need to put into play. Now, this, if you look at the left hand side, side corner of the side, this is an 11 year old slide, which is why the devices you see over there, everything on the slide. Uh, and I kept it here on purpose because a lot of this has not changed in the last 10 years. So, basically, the biggest problem in mobile ad hoc networks is right, you may be in range, you may be out of range very soon depending on what your device you're trying to do. If your device is trying to connect with, uh, you know, your phone is trying to connect with the heart rate monitor, and you suddenly walk, uh, you know, 10 feet away from it, gone. So 
the, what happens is you don't have fixed topology. You don't have a fixed way to always be connected to all the devices. So how do devices be smart enough to accommodate for all that? And you know, there are tons of uh, research protocols around you know, ad hoc routing between different nodes. Uh, there's some, I mean, it's beyond the scope of this conversation. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is there's enough of academic research and defense department research in this space. Uh, I, you know, these are old slides that I'm just running through just to kind of uh, give you an example of the number of different things that we try to do to counter for what TCP lacks, to counter for what the internet lacks today if you take away the fixed environment, if you take away the fixed base, if you take away the network that we're depending on, a lot of the communication without the fixed network is in trouble. Now, if I'm in a car um, and I'm trying to send information from one phone to the other, I shouldn't have to use the cellular network. Not always. If I have 10 devices, I don't want all of them to go up and come back down. That's the beauty of the mobile ad hoc network, is we want to be able to do some amount of work within our environment, within you know, a local environment or within a personal environment, within an office or a factory environment. And you know, there's, as I said, these are beyond the scope of discussion. I just put this in to kind of give you an example of the amount of research that's been going on in this space. And I think the industry needs to look at picking up the right things from this space and leveraging it because the IoT space will need, uh, it will eventually be a huge and growing mobile ad hoc network. There are a lot of issues in this space. I, there are no solutions yet. There are some of them which are pretty good for certain scenarios, but given the number of IoT scenarios we will encounter, the, the usage uh, in a war zone is different, the usage in an oil field is different. The usage in a hospital is different. Uh, the kind of traffic patterns that you will have in, in an ER, emergency room scenario in the hospital, will be different from what you will have uh, on a guy working in an oil refinery who's trying to manage between 10 different locations in the refinery to make things happen. And the biggest problem is we've been talking about MQTT, XMPP, all kinds of things that all runs on top of the network. They are not the network. And the problem is they will only run reliably well when you have quality assurances below. When there is no quality assurance in the mobile ad hoc network, in the IoT space, all those apps will have difficulty. I'm not saying they will fail all the time. They will have difficulty maintaining what they need to maintain. The good part is we've optimized that layer of the stack. Right? We looked at. Uh, over HTTP and over XML, uh, over web services, we've gotten you know new version, new spec of HTTP. Uh, someone mentioned web sockets. Uh, a lot of these protocols have been streamlined at that level. What we need is for that to go down further. The stack needs to be become more intelligent. The seven layers need to be more optimized, not just at the top, not just at the bottom, the overall structure. And that's. One of the issues. Um, so how do we do that, right? Uh, if you look at human beings, we're pretty intelligent creatures. You know, we are able to ignore uh, trust uh, over, over here, a lot of conversations that we have. Being able to, uh, let's say there, there's a party and there's five groups of people talking about five things. I can walk in and join whichever group I want. I could be having two conversations with a uh, conversation with someone and kind of also pick up on another conversation going on on the side. A lot of this stuff is very intuitive, natural for us. A lot of these things of how we communicate, how we uh, back off from communication. So let's say, since I'm talking here now, everyone's quiet. Even if, if, even if they're upset and don't get what I'm talking about as some academic research. Uh, there's a certain way that we roll in and roll out. Uh, there's a certain way where uh, if someone's talking in Mandarin between two people, I can't understand what's going on. Um, a lot of these things are inherent to human beings. Trust, uh, 
I can trust a friend to a certain level. I can trust a family member to a different level. I may not tell a family member something that I tell a friend. A lot of this stuff to humans is very complex, very intuitive. We need to be able to derive these things and bring it to the IoT space. Again, why? Because we have moved more and more away from computing and computers and networks to human beings. We are getting closer and closer to the edge of who we are, how we do things, and things need to work around us. Before you need, you need internet access, you have to go to a terminal, sit down, log in, telnet, you know, good old black and white terminals, right? Today, I don't, if my Bluetooth headset it does not connect to my phone, I get upset. You try to sync, you try to sync, uh, sync your phone to uh, iPhone to iTunes over Wi-Fi, it's pain. That's just two devices, three devices. And I think I said, you know, to help with to help with uh, Wi-Fi, I'm just going to use the USB cable. But as we go more and get more and more untethered, uh, and as more and more devices are, are, are tagged onto us, wearable computing, call it what you want. We need more and more ways for these to intelligently talk to each other without using too much battery, without using the airspace. Imagine uh, who, who does yoga or kickboxing in a 24-hour fitness kind of class? Anyone? Some kind of group class, group event, group cycling? Now imagine 20 people in that room, each having five different sensors. You want to watch, the amount of crosstalk is going to be phenomenal. The amount of interference is going to be phenomenal. The amount of security needs to make sure your information is with you and not, does not go to someone else's phone, about my body records going into someone else's phone, is going to be phenomenal. I was going to list all the standards bodies that I kind of went through, uh, you know, the NTOM Alliance, uh, One Scene Alliance. You can name all of them. Uh, I still have not seen them talking about these issues. I haven't seen them. A large part of what has been established is they're uh, optimizing the HTTP stack. They're optimizing the XML messaging. They're optimizing uh, how lean you can be in terms of publish and subscribe. But I don't see the kind of things that I want to talk about here. Um, how easily uh, we establish and de-establish trust. So to give an example, uh, you know, trust you know, is very complex for human beings. I may, I may trust my cousin who's uh, a tech geek with my laptop, but I will not give it to my father or to my little cousin brother. But on the other hand, my car keys, my father can take but I won't be giving it to my cousin. So all these trust relationships are very complex. You can give your accounting information to your accountant, but you won't share that with your doctor. Medical information with the doc, there's the whole, we are really, very complex beings when it comes to trust. I may trust. It's all competence, right? Competence. For example, accountant is not competent in numbers. True, but at the same time, right? Even if it's, I take, take two friends, I may talk to one friend about something. I'm going to talk to another one about something else. And these are, you know, we do this so intuitively. But uh, if I say something to a friend and he passes it on to someone else, I'm like, how do you tell that to that person? I... So this trust and trans transference of trust, right? How do you ensure that this trust is not broken? How do you figure out that if I gave something to a person X, he doesn't give it to person Y. And let's say I give it to X, say, okay, you can give it as far as you can understand well. Maybe they can give up to three further points and I want to revoke it if it goes beyond a certain limit. These are complex trust relationships. We can talk all about certificates, signatures, and private and digital keys. That, that's just a technical uh, implementation. You know, when I, when I say, right, Computers, the security and the networks we designed before were around connecting devices, around connecting computers, around connecting boxes which had fixed wires. 
the more we go towards an open, open environment with the IoT, the more the human paradigm comes into play. I may share my you know, biological sensor with my spouse or partner or someone. I may not share it with uh, a work colleague. A lot of these things, these parameters of how we extend trust, how we give out trust, how we transfer trust, how we revoke trust, how we delegate trust is going to be extremely complex. And to add to that, 10 devices. Uh, one is monitoring my blood, the other is monitoring something else. I don't know. Hopefully, there's only one for that. Being able to coordinate and orchestrate between all of them is going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Because uh, one thing that Julian mentioned, uh, I don't know if you guys were at his talk yesterday, right? Is there was a hospital scenario where mm, you enter some information about a patient, and one system says, oh, no, they have to be admitted right away. Another says they can't be released right now. Being able to coordinate, even if you have massive amounts of intelligent systems at the back, being able to coordinate between different systems on the cloud, different systems on your phone, as well as the micro coordination between all the devices around you, that's going to be interesting. And I haven't seen many people talk about that. What kind of mechanisms do we need in place to rework the internet so that it's more um, it revolves around us as human beings and not around computers. Because so far, it was easy. Computer, computer, life is simple. When we start putting more devices on ourselves, uh, whether they're wearable devices, whether they're uh, for personal use or for work use or for a factory, the environment gets increasingly complex, increasingly saturated, and the transference of trust becomes so critical. If I trust my corporate email to come onto this phone, and if I trust uh, my Bluetooth headset to read out that email to me, am I at risk if my Bluetooth headset gets stolen or lost? Is my company's confidential information gone somewhere? I don't know. And being able to, because the more we connect each of these disconnected devices, mobile, the more it's like it's like giving it's like having uh, initially it's like having five dogs on a leash, right? I've let the leash go, and now they're free to roam about. Bringing them back, and what to do if one of them is gone? What to do if one of my soldiers in my cavalry has been caught by the enemy? What do you do? Do you still trust the information that's coming from? How do you know? It's him. So all these kind of scenarios, right, come into play, from you know a home scenario to a war scenario, to a hospital. It all changes, and these are the things that I want to address. The thing is, most people, most people will think, right, what are the answers? I don't have the answers for all of these. I want to bring this out because I don't think one person can fig figure out this problem. It's, it's already been re in research for 10, 15, 20 years. But I need and want the industry to think about it, to talk about it. Because these are the scenarios that will come into play when you have five devices each person, 10 devices each person, 20, 30 devices in a home. And I, I can think of you know an Apple TV. I can think of a Netflix box. And I can think of five different things sitting in my living room right now. The number of things that will augment our lives at home and at work are going to increase. How are we going to manage that? Not from just an administration point, point of view, not from just a remote monitoring point of view. That's easy. How do we manage the ad hoc behavior that we will be exhibiting while using all these devices? Those are the questions I want to ask. I know it was a little bit of left field. 
away from all the MQTT and XMPP and everything else that everyone's trying to build upon. I'm saying what we are building upon, we need to look at that again and see, is it going to be sustainable to reach one of those sci-fi movie spaces, right? Where, you know, Will Smith is running around and things are happening because I want them to happen. The, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just, yeah, just a question. Uh, even though there aren't the answers yet, um, I suspect there are some groups that, are, um, that you might be aware of that are uh, making progress in this or focused on it. I know Google supplied the original work that ended up, not that it's an ad, a map, a map uh, mobile ad hoc network. I guess, I guess it was, but it was the foundation, um, I'm forgetting the name now, but at any rate, that was used in Egypt initially. Mm -hmm. So I know Google was doing some work. Are there uh, any that you're aware of? So there, as I said, right, a lot of the, the slides I skipped through really fast, the 11-year-old ones. Um, I went and I did a retouch on where those protocols are. And it's still under research. And th the thing is, right, uh, I was out of this mobile ad hoc network space 10 years back. It it's, it's probably changed, it's improved. I, I'm not, again, I'm not deep enough into it again to the point of academic research. The interesting thing is these are things that are probably the most complex scenarios and the most complex protocols researched by DOD, right? DARPANET became the ARPANET, became the internet. The defense is always 10, 20 years ahead of us. If you, if you think we have something phenomenal today, I'm sure black ops have something, you know, 10 years ahead of us. The thing is, right, a lot of this is probably out there in the academic research world. And it has remained there, or at least as far as I knew, has remained there largely because it was not feasible. No one had so many such devices. The only people who thought about such things 10 years back was Defense Department saying, we want 30 of our Marines connected when they land on a beach. And they're going to fight different directions. Right? But it's finally reaching the fringe of consumer side, right? Which is why I've come back to this space, because of one of my first loves. And at the same time, I think industry needs to pull in uh, first, become aware of these scenarios. We're thinking devices. We're not thinking air saturation. Put, put 100 mobile phones, uh, 100 laptops into this room. There goes the Wi-Fi. So a lot of these scenarios, right, if you envision, then you can say, OK, look back and say, no, nah, this is not going to be good enough. This is going to get more complex. So the industry needs to look at the academia, uh, as well as defense scenarios. I'm sure defense has figured some of this out. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I, I don't have access to that stuff anymore. But without looking at those things, um, we can go forward only so much. And then the IoT uh, uh, first thing will be like the dot-com bubble, right? The first e-commerce dot-com died in 2000, 2001. And the real benefits of B2B started happening in 05, 06, when you know, service-oriented architecture, business process management, uh, being able to choreograph, choreograph events between 10 different devices, 10 different business flows came about. So the way I look at the IoT space is the same thing needs to happen is we need to pull in more intelligence from different areas and say, is this going to be? something that will survive 10 years, 20 years, like IPTCP did? No. Then what, what are the things we need to build? What are the gaps in the capabilities we need? So you know, my friend tells me MQTT is perfect for what it does in terms of collecting device information. It's perfect. But it does not account for all scenarios. Right? So we want to think about scenarios and say, what are the gaps that cannot be taken care of by the existing designs, by the existing standards, by the existing protocols that we need to think about. Any thoughts, questions? Anyone have trouble managing their devices? Well, I had trouble this morning. My, my laptop crashed, and I had to transfer 
everything from to hard drives and into this new machine. And the PowerPoint is still not licensed yet. <laughs> who, who uses Dropbox and cloud services? Why did you first start using them? Because you got an iPad? Sorry? Yeah, and it's a pain trying to sync between them. And I know, but what I'm saying is you're using it because it's a pain syncing between yeah. two devices or three devices. And, and we're just talking about syncing files. When you're talking about so many different kinds of information that you will want to have easy access to, be able to throw out easily, be able to pull in easily, you may want to give your cardiac information to your doctor and say, OK, here's for the last week and a half. The number of devices, the level of automation should make our lives easier, not more complex. And what I'm finding now is the more devices I have, the more complex my life gets. So I have an iPad, and I'm thinking, I have, it's a pain for, well, I use, use it mostly just for reading stuff, casual reading. I don't do much work on it. So I said, You should use uh, iPhone 6 Plus. <laughs> <laughs> it iPad. Well, depends, right? I don't like reading on such a small screen. That, that's the thing, right? The number of devices, how you use it is going to change so much. If you start, you know, even adding something as simple as a Fitbit, right? The number of things that are going to increase eventually are going to be more and more. When I connected my phone to a rental car, it started downloading my contacts via Bluetooth. I don't want that to happen. Why should, I, why should the rental car pick up all my contacts via Bluetooth, but that's a convenience if it's my car. I don't want to have to think about that. So these are these are you know issues that will come up more and more. The more devices come up, and if you look at security, right? They say you could go to any Starbucks, and all of your information can be hacked if you don't use a VPN. All of your information. If you're using Starbucks Wi-Fi, there are people who can pull all your information if you're not using a VPN. I hope that like, just like uh, some device will be getting you know stronger and more powerful. So like iPhone, I, iPhone six, right? I use that. I don't use iPad. I never use iPad mm -hmm. because I feel iPhone is good cool enough, even smaller. But True. The screen is very good. Antenna, right? But now why are they the I, I, iPhone six sell one weekend for ten million? Because that's in the mid size. True. Right? IPad, I agree. So actually, a lot of people, my friend told uh, me, they will get rid of iPad. Because iPad is too big. I get it. You know, it on the, on the hand, right? So in the median side, it should, you know, unifies a lot of me. I agree. But what I'm saying is, you can replace that. But if you have five different devices for different things, like monitoring your health, Something else, right? And <laughs> I'm saying the number of things that you carry is yeah. most people carry will increase. Actually, there is one of big obstacle. A lot of people don't want to use extra, you know, uh, 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 device. They want to put that in a in an app, right? You're able to use iPhone, you know, to do all that IoT stuff, you know, monitoring health, blood pressure, you know, that thing. Yeah. Because nobody want to carry five devices in, in the same time. Fair enough. So that 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 is my point. You know, you need to reduce those devices. Okay. Any questions? I can wrap this up. Thank you. Thank you. Good talk. Thank you.